described as a scholar, a banker, Chairman of the Board of Trustees Fund. Now, born in Azari, Katagum local government area of Bauchi State, he had his early education in Azari. He attended the Bauchi College of Arts and Science and later Ahmadu Billu University, Zaria, where he took a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration with specialization in banking and finance. He obtained a master's degree in management and technology from the University of Wales Institute of Science and Technology and a PhD in international relations and diplomacy from the University of Abuja. Now his working career began with National Youth Service at the United Bank for Africa UBA. He was later a commercial officer at the Bauchi State Ministry of Trade and Tourism from where he moved to Allied Bank of Nigeria PLC, rising to be regional manager at different times for the north and western branches of the bank. He later voluntarily retired as group head public sector department of the bank. Let's, let's welcome to one-on-one -on -one Dr. Musa Babayu. Thanks for being with us. Thank you today. very much, Sarah. <coughs> well, you have been described as uh, a scholar, a banker, a politician, well, now you had TET Fund, which is an interventionist agency. So, what should we describe you as now? Well, someone who has a fairly good experience in different branches of government, different branches of our national life, as you have rightly mentioned, from finance, banking, academic, politics, and now a manager of a public sector institution. Mm. As a politician, which is the second vocation, came into politics with strong credentials into the highest level professionally in my chosen career, which is banking. And the major breakthrough I had was in 2008 when I was elected the Deputy National Secretary of the ruling party, PDP, and later National Secretary of the same party until 2012 National Convention. After serving the party with diligence, with dedication, and utmost commitment and integrity for the cause of building a better Nigeria which the People's Democratic Party basically symbolized. Mm. From the party, I have a dual responsibility, special grace of God and benevolence of Mr. President, President Goodalaki Bele Jonathan. All right, from two of the Act in 2011, which led the organization to metamorphose to what it is today with an education trust fund. That is what I've been doing for the last five years. And as an academic, I have been involved in teaching and lecturing, not as a full-time lecturer, mm -hmm. but as a volunteer right. to help add value to knowledge and scholarship, okay. sharing my experiences in both private and public sector to our younger ones, so that through us and the modest contribution one is making of knowledge, they will become better citizens that okay. will give so much too in the future for the growth and development of our country. All right. So that puts you in a very good position to understand the challenges that the education sector is facing, yeah. particularly in terms of funding. So tell us about this interventionist agency which you had today. Well, what specifically would TED Fund, was TED Fund set up? address. Yeah. 
Tertiary Education Trust Fund primarily has amended to rehabilitate, reconstruct and consolidate educational infrastructure in our country using funding project management as the vehicle of delivery of those services. We have intervened in three key areas toward the growth and development of the educational sector in our country. Prior to 2011, when we have a new change of focus, we were involved in addressing the critical educational challenges in the areas of infrastructure, especially in both basic secondary segment of our educational sector. So we're involved in provision of infrastructure in all basic schools across the length and breadth of this country in secondary education and the tertiary. In doing so, we were and still guided by the principles of equity, which is embedded and enshrined in the Enabling Act. What I mean by that basically is that at every point in time, our intervention should uh, look and address the character of the Federation. So we try as much as possible at every point in time to balance the Federation. When we make an allocation, to it, we do it on the basis of equality of the states within a geopolitical zone and on the basis of equality of local governments within a state right. and on the basis of equality of the number of primary basic institutions within a local government and so for the secondary segment funding as well. We change to what we are today, as I mentioned, through an act of the National Assembly, which was assented to by Mr. President in July 2011. Primarily, one basic fundamental objective, the desire of government, the desire of Mr. President, President Goodluck Ebele Jonathan, to focus on the growth and development of the tertiary educational institutions in our country. That is primarily the reason for the change. Good. And therefore today, Ted, from 2010 to date, has been funding critical infrastructural needs in our universities, in our polytechnics and colleges of education. But these are the infrastructure-based intervention. They are the intervention that people normally see and feel and touch. All right. That is basically one aspect of the intervention that we do. We have a content-based intervention and education-based. Okay. The education-based intervention basically is on the areas of capacity building for our academics in all the tertiary educational institutions in our country. To date, we have 8,610 scholars run from the universities, from the colleges of education, and polytechnics on this program. Mr. President, through the instrumentality of TED Fund, had funded this program to the tune of 32 billion naira in the last four years. This is significant, iconic, and unprecedented in the political history of this country. Today, the 12 new universities, which were set up by government, nine have already started their academic activities. Three of them are about to take up fully, are drawing their manpower and needs from this pool of academics that Ted Fund 
trained okay. and currently training uh, in all institutions both in nigeria and abroad okay so um as you say the infrastructure the intervention infrastructure that's quite visible people yeah. can see yeah. and see what's going on yeah. um then you have the content and the education piece yes. but first and foremost in order for you to intervene yeah. you would certainly require the funds and that is where we go to next how does the funding of that fund come about where does it draw the funds from from this intervention and its, uh, well activities? from the two percent income tax paid by companies and businesses operating in nigeria and by other individuals taxable adults right two percent yes two percent and this had seen some kind of an exponential growth as well over the last four years all right in in a country where it is generally known that uh, uh, the payment of tax especially by institutions it's not it's not really easy um we've had uh, cases where institutions had to be um you know actually pursued to be able to recover taxes from there. How does Tet Fund now guarantee the fact it can continue to draw from this 2% uh, payable tax? We, we collect our taxes through the Federal Air Revenue Service. Okay. In its agency, it's an agency of government, the FIRS, is structured, staffed, and manned with highly skilled and competent manpower, trained to carry out this important national responsibility and FRS has been doing an excellent job in this. as I mentioned the taxes or the tax collected for the fund have been growing exponentially okay from 2009 to 2013 which was the last date of collection 31st December 2013 for the uh, 2013 accounting year the exponential growth is a result of combination of so many factors. Mm -hmm. One of them, of course, is the commitment, dedication, and passion of the executive management and staff of the Federal Air Revenue Service. They have been working around the clock to ensure that this important tax tax that has succeeded in transforming our educational life as a nation, being paid and collected as and when due. The second reason are the internal reforms that as a board of trustees we have impact upon in the fund to give this important mandate of the fund a special focus. We have restructured and created a special uh, uh, unit of funds generation to interface and continuously collaborate with the Federal Air Revenue Service by visiting all our large tax offices nationwide on continuous basis to ensure that these taxes are collected. And the third reason are much more fundamental is the enabling environment. Which government has created for businesses to thrive in Nigeria? Primarily because of the transformational initiatives of Mr. President. Our businesses have not recorded fundamental growth in terms of their gross earnings, their profit before tax have increased geometrically. So was the net profit. We get the 2% of whatever the total profits of these companies okay. are. And since they are doing well, sure they will pay more. Okay. And they are paying more because government has liberalized the economic environment. A clear indication of how successful the connection between politics and policy yes. is. Transformation agenda in this particular aspect of our national life is working perfectly well. All right. So the question of collection of taxes is solved there. But again, we might ask you, how huge is the infrastructure deficit 
um, in the nation's uh, tertiary uh, institutions because it's quite easy to look at um, those institutions and see the huge amount of work that needs to be done. And when you look at uh, the, the, uh, the state of the tertiary institutions and the collectible funds you have, do you feel that um, this can really address the problem? I think yes, it can address the problem. But it requires time. Because developmental challenges cannot be resolved in one day. Cannot be resolved in one year, four years or even eight years. There has to be a continuous intervention. Yes, the challenges of infrastructural decay are there. But the amount of funding equally can never be enough anywhere in the world. The uh, endowment of Harvard for 2011-12 was $30 billion. But there are 101 ways of raising funds to fund education, not necessarily from the public source. But for a public university, a public college of education and polytechnic, on a continuous basis through the instrumentality of TED Fund, as I mentioned earlier, government is funding. Apart from funds that are coming from line charges, the total funding requirement for education, TED funds only account for 6%. Okay. And, but it accounts for 60% of the projects. There are other issues that are important and that needs to be looked at. And those are issues from the demand side. There is always a continuous demand for increased funding, for increased funding, for increased funding by our institutional managers. Government has been addressing the supply side within the budgetary constraints. Whatever is collected by TED fund is disbursed based on a ratio embedded in the Enabling Act okay. of 211. So whatever is collected, 50% of it goes to the universities, 25% right. to the polytechnics, and 25% to the colleges of education. Nothing is kept left behind other than the poor percent cost of collection, which is in the FRIS law, because they have to set up special infrastructure, fully manned and supported by their own bureaucracy to ensure that these funds are collected. And those funds are collected by collected at source to enable them to continue to function. Otherwise, whatever is collected is released. There is money coming from the uh, 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 normal budgetary yeah. line hedges. Yeah. And they go for the funding of education, for the provision of critical infrastructure. And even the universities and polytechnics and colleges of education, they have other sources of revenues. And that is a challenge for them to unlock hidden opportunities within the institution themselves so that more funding can be generated. All right. You said um, in, in administering these funds, you look at many parameters yes. um, and you take into consideration the federal character of the nation and with so many institutions you know requesting for intervention especially in the areas of infrastructure how do how do you how do you now disperse these funds so how do the institutions qualify on what basis do you well one of the major requirements for enlistment as a beneficiary of TED fund intervention there must be a law setting up that academic institution right. by the relevant body at the center by the federal government, at the state by the states, because all public, public, all public tertiary institutions have access to these funds. There must be an evidence of commencement of academic activities. So if a new institution is established by law with a defined location, but has not commenced an activi academic activity, will not access our funds. And basic requirements in terms of the faculties, the number of staff at professor level and other levels that are critical to the survival of an educational institution, the evidence must be there. And of course, we encourage the institutions to ensure that they have a minimum of five years strategic plan so that they will know at every point in time where they are in order to assess their need, where they want to go, and how they intend to get there.
objective basically is that the moment an allocation is made, the universities should, as a matter of urgency, begin the process of accessing that allocation so that it can be trans tra translated into major infrastructural projects within the universities or colleges of education or polytechnics. How well have they performed in accessing these funds? Because we do hear, of course, of um, other intervention agencies saying sometimes there are funds lying there for institutions to access, so they don't access those yeah. funds. <coughs> How well have they performed in the case of Tech Fund? Well, uh, if one looks at it globally, one may say not too well. On individual basis at a micro level, some institutions are doing very, very well. Others are lagging behind. And we have been calling the institutions through our different platforms to come forward and access the unaccessed funds. The unaccessed funds are for them. It doesn't make much sense for as to go out looking for additional funding when you have funds that have already been allocated for you and accessed. And they were unaccessed primarily because of lack of compliance with our templates. Okay. And it's important maybe I use this opportunity exactly. just so we'll to, 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 to explain yes. what, 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 what these templates are. What are these templates? If we, would... give you, if we give you an allocation of a certain sum for a project, for instance, to build an auditorium, a lecture theater, a classroom, an academic staff building, a senate building, or provision of physical uh, uh, activities in the university, like sports halls and so on and so forth, what we are required to do is to prepare an architectural drawing for that facility <laughs> and price it. These are the only two requirements. The moment you do that, you submit the project to us forbidding a reconciliation. And the objective of that phase essentially is to ensure that the prices are right, are in conformity with the best international practices, and congruent with the principles and provisions of our Procurement Act. And once it is satisfied, it is done, and we ensure that we do it within 48 hours. For those that submit, we'll give you an acceptance or a rejection decision. If it is accepted, we'll give you go ahead by issuing an AIP, which is we will call an approval in principle to go and start due process at your own level. We don't do it at the TED fund level because TED fund is not a contract awarding institution. It's an interventionist agency. You go to your own level and begin the due process as per the provisions of the Procurement Act. Those things are complied. We'll send our people to ensure that there are compliance. For construction, we release 50% or whatever amount of money allocated for you to a TED fund dedicated account under your control. If you are procuring engineering equipment or lab equipment, you access 85% straight away. The balance of the 15% after delivery, installation, and training, and then you access the 15%. So it's a simple template. There's nothing difficult about this. That is why we said prepare your strategic plan in advance. All right. In the case of the structures, you release 50% of the cost. Does TED Fund go ahead and keep a monitoring eye on how work progresses on the structure? Exactly. Monitoring is one of the major mandates of the fund. In fact, it is, it is embedded in the Enabling Act. A command language is used, shall monitor, the law says. And therefore, we have a monitoring and evaluation department. The moment the funds are released, we begin the monitoring process 40 days after the first release to ensure that the project has taken up. And we will never stop monitoring until it has reached a level whereby the project will now access the second tranche of the 35% for a construction. When you reach a reasonable certain limit based on the details of the documentation you have submitted, we allow you to access 35% when you reach that level. And the balance of the 15% after the mandatory period uh, uh, of, of three or six months after completion. Monitoring is something that we do on a continuous basis. And that is basically one of our major success factors. Today, Ted Fund has no single 
pill project nationwide. And we have delivered on over 30,000 projects. Right. So if, if just like you have explained, this process is fairly simple and straightforward, why would institutions now sit back and not access funds which they ordinarily should have access to? Honestly, that is what is baffling us. We had in November our strategic planning workshop. Prior to the workshop, the Honorable Minister of Education had specially invited all the vice chancellors, rectors, and provosts of colleges of education, polytechnics, and universities to a one day interactive session at NUC Auditorium here in Abuja to discuss this particular problem. In part, the Honorable Minister of Education went further and set up a small subcommittee made up of the benefiting institutions to look at the template of TED Fund and cause an amendment to happen. Should there be anything in the template that suggests that it that suggests that it's difficult for them to access their allocations. They said they submitted a report. They said everything is perfect. We shall continue with the template. Institutions have a huge responsibility. The institutional managers. There is a need for capacity to be built at the institutional level. The demand side of the equation must be addressed. So the critical stakeholders, the unions in every institution, the, the, the managers of the institution and their councils have a responsibility to come together and address this problem. Just two days ago, the chairman of all federal colleges of education paid a courtesy call on TED Fund. I had received them on behalf of the Board of Trustees. We had an interaction and we downloaded the volume of their outstanding for each institution. It was mind boggling. They simply couldn't believe it. G give us an idea into just how much we're, we're looking at here. Yeah. I have over 138 billion on access funds for the polytechnics, for the colleges of education, and the universities. Dr. Dr. Babayu, is it possible, since you have institutions that, for one reason or the other, are not accessing what they ordinarily should access, is it possible for you to have a situation where an institution which does access the funds, deploys it appropriately, and gets result, is it possible for that institution to come and get more still? And on the basis of they're doing so well, then they should have more funds. Exactly. exactly. Because of the principles of equality which is embedded in the law, we are, regulatory, we are checked by the regulatory environment from, from simply doing that. But the institutions that are doing extremely well are having greater benefits in terms of improved services within the institution themselves. Their institution, it may not be fair for me to mention names here, that we have allocated under our high impact program, which we started in 2009. We allocated a large volume of financial resources for the provision of critical infrastructure, for program upgrades, for improvement of learning and teaching environment, for library development, for book development, for comparison. To date, as I'm speaking with you at this hour, they only access beautiful percent of this money. And in between, we have given them their normal annual allocations. Last year alone, Mr. President graciously approved for a release a total sum of 90.7 billion normally. This is aside of the additional funding provided by government under the need assessment. So each university received close to 600 million. All the federal and state universities that are public. One of the biggest challenges Nigeria faces is the issue of strikes, you know, and shutdowns of institutions. And every time this happens, we hear that um, it's tied in one way or the other to poor infrastructure in those institutions. And I'm amazed that you have such huge funds 
lying there waiting to be accessed. And yet, year in, year out, you find unions in academic institutions say nothing is being done to improve on the infrastructure. How do, how, how do you reconcile that? A reconcilable position. I always find it extremely difficult to, 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 to really uh, reconcile the two positions. I will understand if critical stakeholders will require more funding. No money is too small or too much for funding of education. But to say that there is no fund, that is not, in my own opinion, based on facts, based on objective criteria, they are not the correct position of things on the ground. No, they are not. That is why there is a need for a paradigm shift. We have been looking at the supply side. The supply is not coming, is not moving at the required uh, uh, phase and so on and so forth. It's now time for us to look at the demand side. Something, what went wrong? Why should an institution continue to demand for more funds when they have funds unaccessed? Yeah. It's only reasonable to spend what you have in your kitty and go out for more. There's nothing wrong about that. We have. It's a board of trustees collapsed even four years allocation together in order to help and facilitate access. What I mean by collapsing, one of our cardinal principles is that we will not allow you to access this intervention unless you completely exited from last year's, which means the project must be closed out. We don't want a situation whereby you keep on moving from one project to the other without a single project being completed. Because as I mentioned earlier, Tetfan has no single abandoned project nationwide. We do that because of that. But because of the pressure and the need to, 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 to enhance the speed of access, we will collect four years together. We just submit proposals. We will bet them. We will reconcile them. We will give you approval in principle to go back to your domain and begin the due process. Even that, we are not moving at the desired phase. So something that has to be done, and what needs to be done, in my own opinion, is a fundamental change of attitude by our institutional managers. We have to be passionate about access. We have to be passionate about the growth and development of these sector, uh, institutions, just like we do with agitation or more funding. All right, that's as, um, as far as the infrastructure beat is, uh, 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 as far as the infrastructure beat goes. But we'll return to it. Let, let's move on to the other intervention, which is not well known now, yes. which is really not physical, and that's the content and education base, in which you said you have uh, trained some 8,600. Uh, uh, as I did, we have 8,601 <laughs> academics for showing PhDs and master's degrees in both foreign and Nigerian universities. Uh, what are the criteria for this? Uh, we, the criteria, one, you must be an academic staff currently on the faculty of any of the tertiary educational institutions. And because of our desire and commitment not to get involved on issues that may sound to be subjective in, 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 in content and form, we allow the institutions All right. to select the academics that they will want to sponsor on this program annually. What is required basically, once the selections are made, admissions are uh, obtained by these academics, the details are sent to us for betting and approval. And we release the funds directly to the institutions for funding of the program, either for academics who are within the country or those who are outside. As I mentioned, this is an ingenious innovation of Mr. President. President Goodluck Ebele Jonathan, being an academic himself and knowing the problems of academics in our educational institutions, he directed this special project vehicle to be developed. To date, 1,118 of these academics have completed their PhDs and back to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. 8,600 are on the program. 
this year alone, or rather last year, as at November, we gave additional funding for more academics. 145 million naira each to each university. And oh. 35 to each polytechnic and college of education. Right. If, if um, uh, we, we're seeing institutions not accessing for the development of infrastructure, are we seeing the same thing in the area of uh, developing the capacity of uh, the academics? No. Uh, the assessment has the, been... Very good. The no. assessment for the academic side program is, is, I will say, is very good. We are operating at 86, 92 percent confidence interval. Okay. So things are reasonably going well. And just like we monitor the infrastructure-based interventions, we equally monitor the education-based interventions. Apart from the academic staff training and development, we have the conference attendance. Okay. Mr. President, to date from 2010, had approved through the instrumentality of TED Fund the sum of more than five billion to sponsor our academics to attend conferences both in Nigeria and abroad. We have a special intervention in equally in the areas of institution-based research. The IBRs we call them, our objective essentially is to stimulate research activities in our academic institutions. We give an annual allocation to each tertiary education institution in this country for this important activity. On the average, a billion plus every year, split across the board. And the library development. We don't want our libraries in the colleges of education, in polytechnics, and the universities to be empty. We want them to be revitalized on continuous basis. So we intervene specially by giving special funding support, apart from the one for the infrastructure, for the development of the libraries in all the tertiary education in this country. To date, on the average, about four billion more. Now, these interventions, do they run concurrently? I mean, uh, for instance, an institution can access funds for infrastructure development, at the same time still be accessing funds for uh, programs for its um, academic staff, and also access more funds in terms of developing libraries and research uh, capacity. Yes, they run concurrently. Right. Yeah, at the same time, you can access all the projects. All the intervention, the different type of intervention. Just as long as you comply with the template. As long as you comply with the template. And that is why we have TED Fund dedicated officers in every institution of higher learning in this country, in tertiary educational institutions. And to ensure that we control, we monitor both physically and financially, every institution has a TED Fund dedicated account. Our Intervention budget doesn't go to a regular account of the institution. Every institution through their council must open a TED fund dedicated account before enlistment. So that whenever our financial monitors, they can easily target that particular account for, 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 for auditing and, and inspection. We have so much and we are doing so much at, at, at a global level at a macro level, national level, Mr. President in 2010 approved a national research fund. One of the problems that we kept on hearing from our academics and other critical stakeholders within the Nigerian education uh, sector, lack of research facilities, research funding support, and so on and so forth. So Mr. President approved the sum of five billion naira is a national research fund warehoused in TED Fund. We have been managing the funds on behalf of all the Nigerian researchers, both in Nigeria and in diaspora. What is required? Go to our website, download the form, or fill the application online, and meet your research proposals. And we download and hand over to our technical action group. 
we have a 32 months group under Professor Bamiro, the former Vice Chancellor University of Ibadan. They are charged with the responsibility of sweeping through, analyzing and dissecting the proposals and to find those ones that are pandable. Yeah. We have pandered 13 out of the over 300 we received over the years. Last year, in November, the Honorable Minister of Education, on behalf of Mr. President, presented letters of allocation of 249 million to certain researchers in our universities nationwide. We have a sister uh, project which we call the Book Development Fund. Right. Tell the, us about the that. The Book Development Fund is another fund warehouse in Ted Fund. Because of the passion, as I mentioned earlier, Mr. President, for education, he approved three billion as a national book development fund warehouse in Ted Fund to support academic public. Objective, our PhD theories that are scattered around our universities. We should look for those that are publishable. Those that can be converted into books for the benefit of our students and for the benefit of the Nigerian people. We set up another technical action group for this particular project to drive it. Professor Atahiri Diegao, the pioneer chairman of this group, when he was the vice chancellor of Bayer University, Kano, was, he led a 49 member academics. Currently, we have such 2,000 volumes of such PhD studies that have been converted into books in production by the University of Ibadan Press. We expect delivery in the next seven days for distribution. FOC said the president to all Nigerian universities, colleges of education and polytechnics, said two thousand volumes of such books. The National Book Development Fund, the National Research Fund, are revolutionary and iconic ideas that very many Nigerians are not aware probably about until now. All right, Dr. Babayu, let me take you to a, a, a basic problem in education. And uh, this, in spite of all efforts that successive governments in Nigeria have made towards addressing it, it seems to persist. That's the question of seeing school age children roaming the streets. And this has been one difficult challenge um, that. Um, you know, it's yet to be addressed to the level that uh, people. What, what, what do you what do you suggest? It's, it's a happen? big it's a big problem because the children of today, who are below the age of ten, who are supposed to be in school, but roam in the streets, will be a potential danger to the society in adulthood. Government has a responsibility to ensure that they are so educated. In Ted Fund, the President and Commander in Chief, Dr. Goodluck Ebele Jonathan, directed us prior to the exit from funding of basic education to embark on something not completely new, but something that has never been done at such a large scale in the political history of this country. The construction, equipping of al Majri schools. The president directed that a census should be conducted. So a center in Ario House, Center for Regional Integration and Development conducted a study. Mm. And at the end, of it all, they turn in a huge figure of 9.5 million children who are in various Almajri and Zangaya schools nationwide. These are our children. Significant percentage of them are opens from rural areas. They have no access to education. And Mr. President said, these are our children. They are Nigerian children. And he said he has a responsibility to ensure that he gives them education. In a formal sense, combining both the Quranic and the technical and vocational education under one roof. So at some point in time, you were involved with the Tsangaya 
Yeah. yeah. At one point in time, we are involved with Zangaya. We have 49 Zangaya model schools built by Ted Fund. Both boarding and day. The one in Sokoto, which was commissioned by Mr. President himself because of the passion. Precisely a year and a half ago, was a model Zangaya school, boarding school, funded at the instance of government by Ted Fund. These children now have access to education. In fact, Mr. President, at that commissioning ceremony in Sokoto, directed that they should have, they should even be given pre uniforms. Hmm. All the Tangaya schools are fully functional. And through our sister organization, UBEC, we have over 100 more. So this, 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 this is one aspect of it, which we are involved in. The other aspect is a boy-child education. I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the program the responsibility we have to balance the federation at every, at every point in time. Mr. President equally directed that this basic principle within our law should be carried through. So we started the boy-child education targeting Southeast, building schools in market places for our brothers, our children there, to have access to education, while at the same time, pretending over their uh, various trading activities. We have the rest of the program in the West. And of course, the rehabilitation program that are currently going on with our sister, with our universities, the University of Niger Delta, uh, for the reorientation hmm. of our rest views in that part of the country. So the entire national problem, as it affects to these categories of people that you mentioned, are comprehensively being addressed concurrently. All right. And we're making a significant breakthrough. We have covered some mileage. Mm -hmm. Nigerian children, I believe, are happy. Okay. Yeah, with, with government, they're happy with Mr. President for, for this frontal attack to a major problem confronting their future. Okay. Initially, we talked about um, these other interventions, especially in the case of uh, libraries. But you do have a project which you've called Micro Teaching Laboratories. Yes. The micro, the micro Teaching Laboratories is equally one of our flagship. Mr. President directed in 2011 that state fund, through, of course, our foreign ministry, the Ministry of Education, should develop a project that will add value to knowledge, to scholarship, strengthen the capacity of our teachers, those who are charged with the responsibility of teaching others with state-of-the-art facilities comparable to anyone that you can find anywhere in the world. And therefore, he directed and approved that 60 micro-teaching labs should be built in all colleges of education, both federal and state nationwide. These projects have reached 90% in some cases completion level. In few places, 70-75% based because of the topography and other challenges uh, of the environment. And hopefully, on or before the 31st of March, or latest April, this project will be turned in. This is a Nobel idea. It's something that has never happened. We are focused and narrow. Wherever we are going, we ensure that we deliver we first identify and deliver on a project that will change the life of that particular educational institution and by extension the life of the institutions nationwide.
So 60 micro teaching labs are currently ongoing simultaneously. And they will be fully equipped with state-of-the-art facilities, both federal and state, I said state, to make for emphasis. Right. Ordinarily, government will have said no, state excluded. But the president doesn't discriminate when it comes to the issue of education. He doesn't allow the issue of whether it is in an exclusive list or in a concurrent list. Okay. Well, he makes it his problem. Well, if I might just take that beyond the exclusive and concurrent yes. list. Dr. Babayu, how easy is it to walk the thin line between getting these ideals on ground and the sometimes difficult political climate? Given that um, some of the places where you have to intervene, you do not enjoy what is called uh, the political leverage of everybody being a member of your party. You are a politician yeah. still, yeah. if you look at it there. So how do you walk that thin line? It only says, speaks bullet about the benevolence of the president. Ordinarily, he will have allowed politics to define and determine the trajectory of this important national initiative. So today you can confidently say that yeah. uh, politics does not play any part, part. in these efforts to intervene no, not be states run by your party or states that are not run by the opposition not at all not at all all our interventions are purely based on objective criteria that is why if you pick for instance as an example a state university controlled by an opposition state compare the allocations that we have made to that university with the one controlled by our party they're the same that is why all our allocations are made public strategic planning workshop is a, a major flagship we make the distribution openly transparently in front of all the vice chancellors and their council the provost and their council and the rectors and their council okay dr baba as uh, we wind down where do you see tet fund in the next four years in the scheme of things as an interventions agency? Well, I see Tate Fund as an agency of government, an agency that will continue to play a vital role okay. in the provision of funding of critical infrastructure in our tertiary educational institutions. I see Tate Fund is one of Nigeria's export brands. Just as a recap today, Tanzania have copied the model of Tate Fund. Ghana, they have get funds. They came and studied us and set up Ghana Tertiary Education Trust Fund. The Tate Fund of today will be an organization that will be seen as another piece of Nigeria. All right. One of the most successful government agencies in terms of effectiveness, in terms of efficiency, and in terms of strict adherence to rules, regulations, and due process. And this you have described as an exportable initiative. Initiative, in exactly. Dr. Musa Babayu. It's been interesting talking to you. Thank you, and, sir. Uh, as we round off you, Talban Katagu. Yes. That's, uh, well, <laughs> so you do have a foray, of course, into the traditional <laughs> institution as well. Yeah, thank you. Well, we'd like to thank you for coming. Thank we you so much. We hope to uh, call you again some thank other you. time. Thank to you. To find out just how, uh, uh, how much impact TED Fund is making thank on you. the nation's education. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Cyril. Thank you so much. That's our program today. We thank you for being with us. Next week, we'll reach you with another guest. I am Cyril Stober. Bye for now.